Good morning, Pleasant Green parishioners. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad there is.
and equity to not only the African American community, but to all people across the world. Amen. We thank God Amen. for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Brothers and sisters, again, we're thankful that you are uh, a part of our worship service. We thank God for you tuning in. Uh, we now want to turn to the Word of God. We want to turn to the Word of God. Um, I would uh, ask that you turn to the book, uh, the Old Testament book that we usually don't go to. It's a book hidden in the Old, uh, Old Testament. Uh, that book is the book of Joel. The book of Joel. The book of Joel. If you roll with me, I promise you I'll let you go. <coughs> But you got to give me some amen. <laughs> you got to give me some amens virtually and personally. Amen. 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 Put some hands up on the live. Uh, post a heart. Uh, if something that was said uh, that blesses you uh, in this worship service, you ought to repost it, retweet it, uh, or post it wherever you think that uh, it would. <coughs> Uh, be beneficial to people to hear. Brothers and sisters, let's go to Joel, the second chapter. Joel, the second chapter. And we're going to read verses 12 through 14. Joel, the second chapter, verses 12 through 14. There you'll find a rendering that is similar to this. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. In other words, tear your heart open and not your clothes. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Amen. And just for a moment of better, if you all would permit me to use as a thing, bring it on home to me. <laughs> <laughs> bring it on home to me. Brothers and sisters, I'm not sure if you uh, recall or can reflect on that particular thing, but if you cannot, I'll help you recall this thing. May 8, 1962, <coughs> Sam Cooke released a song entitled Bring It On Home to Me. In this short sensual serenade, Sam Cooke sings this. I'm not going to sing it for you. You just go listen to the song. But it says, if you ever change your mind about leaving me behind, bring your sweet love. Bring it on home to me. He presses forward with this song and says, I know I laugh when you left, but I know I only hurt myself. Baby, bring it to me. 
Bring your sweet love and bring it on home to me. The last thing he says, I tried to treat you right, but you stayed out all night, but I forgive you, bring it to me. Bring your sweet loving, bring it on home to me. My brothers and sisters, this song expresses the great desire for the return of Sam's loved one. And while this is the sentiment of Sam, God also continues to call us to bring our love home and reconcile our severed relationship with God. Brothers and sisters, the process of this reconciliation is often an emotional process. As a matter of fact, stories of return tend to move the human heart because there is something about coming back that speaks to the deepest feelings in all of us. For many of us, home represents the place of endeared attachment. Home is the image of intimate familiarity and belonging. With that being said, I'd venture to say that there is no area in life more pressing than the desire to come back into an intimate embrace with God. Whether we realize it or not, brothers and sisters, what I would share with you is that there is an internal imbalance when we are distant and isolated from God. That's why the psalmist says this in Psalm 84 and 2, my soul longs for you. He's talking about God. My soul longs for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh, they cry out for a living God. He knew that when we were are distant from God, we are in existential crisis. In other words, brothers and sisters, when we are far from God, we are in trouble. He knew, brothers and sisters, uh, that we are in a precarious place when we are distant from God. The seasoned saints could say it like this, without God, I would be Nothing without God I would fail without, where are my seasoned saints? Without God, I would be like a ship without a sail. I mean, in essence, life afar from God is an aimless exploration. Without God, brothers and sisters, uh, we are like a ship that is without a sail. And when we are alienated, from God, we experience life, uh, a life that is of a spiritual angst. We experience life that uh, we are in an emotional uneasiness or an emotional mess. When we experience life without God, we even get to a place where we are psychologically restless. Brothers and sisters, when we experience life without God, God is simply trying to corral his children back into a relationship with him. When we are separated from God, we as humanity find ourselves in a loathsome condition. This prophetic prognosticator in our text knew that. Joel knew that. He was trying to speak to us as pleasant parishioners today. Joel, who is labeled as one of the minor prophets, nevertheless makes a major impact in our lives even today. Again, I say that with you, brothers and sisters, although he was mentioned as a minor prophet, 
he nevertheless makes a major impact as he sees at the distance a plague pending over the lives of the people of God. And unless they called or unless they were called back unto repentance, what he sees is that a swarm of locusts, they were looming uh, unless they repented and they were reconciled and returned to be in relationship with God. The overall theme, or the thematic thrust, if you will, that the prophet Joel desires for the people of God uh, that we should give thought to is that if you have been distant from God, or if you have been disconnected from the divine, even though you have been far flung from the Father, you still can return. Joel beseeches us to know that you've never gone too far, that God cannot redeem you. You have not been too broken, brothers and sisters, that God cannot rescue you. You are not too ruined that God cannot reform you. You are not so reprehensible that God cannot forgive you. You are not so dejected that God cannot deliver you. You are not so down and out that God cannot pick you up and give you a second chance because somewhere I heard that Jesus can reach way down. He got long arms kind of like me. Reach way down and pick you up. Maybe you're not really good with contemporary terms, but let me suggest to you uh, a biblical text where it says, David says, he lifted me or he brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of a mire clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my going. All I'm trying to tell you today is that God can reach you wherever you are. God can reach you wherever you are. Now, I want to say this. I mean, this is definitely shout-worthy. It's shout-worthy material. And I think I can cut off and shout you right here. But I think I would be doing a disservice to the divine text uh, if I stop there because what Joel alludes to say is that while you can return to God, the opportunity is for a limited time. I, I want to say it again. Joel is saying that while you can return to the Lord, what the Lord is trying to tell us, the opportunity is for a limited time. Joel wanted the people to understand that while reconciliation was available right now, brothers and sisters, if we decided to postpone or prolong or procrastinate or hesitate, it will be inaccessible later. In other words, what I'm trying to tell somebody right now who is listening, that you ought to take advantage of getting in touch with God while God offers himself to you and God is available. Brothers and sisters, although Joel emphasizes the fact that we can come back to the Lord, he does, however, mention in verse 1 that the day of the Lord's anger is uh, approaching. The day of the Lord's anger is near. I mean, this is not a new thing that church folks have heard. This is not even a new thing that the children of Israel have heard. This is not even a new thing that the children of Judah have even heard because if you roll back the scriptural timeline, you can hear when Isaiah said, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the 
the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thought. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy upon them and our God will, uh, uh, will uh, abundantly pardon. This is not uh, only, this, on, this not only highlights brothers and sisters the folly of procrastination because there is a folly of procrastination. Brothers and sisters, you got to do what God calls you to do when God calls you to do it. But it also emphasizes the importance of self-accountability. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to pause for a moment, moment pastorally and say to all of the pleasant parishioners, brothers and sisters, uh, we, we, th this text is not only highlighting procrastination, but this text is highlighting the importance of self-accountability. In other words, God calls each of us into a place of accountability. God holds each of us accountable for taking advantage of the opportunities that God provides for us to seek his face and seek his hand. Now, I, I want to say it one more time because there's somebody still not getting it. God has allowed you time and space, but God holds us accountable for taking advantage of the opportunities that God provides for us to seek him. Because the truth of the matter is, is that if we fail to engage in self-assessment, in personal examination, disaster will come. In other words, brothers and sisters, we are uh, responsible for our own souls. The church wants to point us to where God wants us to be, but we are responsible for our own So The church is there to show you where Christ is, but it is, it is your responsibility, brothers and sisters, to follow Christ. Self-examination is important. Self-accountability is important. Every now and then, brothers and sisters, we've got to stand ourselves up into the mirror of self-aggrandizement and to show, brothers and sisters, so that we can understand that where uh, we are is where God wants us to be. Granddaddy used to play uh, when I was... Uh, riding with granddaddy on the way to his revivals. I, I was just trying to be a, 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 a faithful uh, grandson and I, I would drive granddaddy from place to place and then he would play a song uh, from uh, the, the, the Alabama, blind, the blind boys of Alabama. The blind boys of Alabama, they would sing a song that sang this. It says, if I died and my soul be lost. I'm trying to preach to y'all today. If I die and my soul be lost, it is nobody's fault but mine. I'm going I'm 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 to preach if ain't nobody saying it. Brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to share with you is that it is our obligation to see that we are saved. He says, if I die and my soul be lost, it is nobody's fault but mine. I had a mama who taught me to pray, but if I died and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. I had a Bible that I could read, but if I die and my soul be lost, it is nobody's fault but mine. I had a song that I could sing, but if I die and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. I want to fast forward that and remix it in the 21st century. What I'm trying to say to the pleasant parishioners and partners of PG, that you've got an opportunity to seek the Lord. You've got YouTube, you've got call-in lines, you've got your own Bible version As we reflect on the 
welcome and the warning of Joel, we discover that as one stays distant from God, I don't know why you're distant from God. Perhaps some folks are distant from God because you're not in the church building. That's not an excuse. You still got to search God for yourself. Brothers and sisters, you still got to get close to God even though you feel like the church is not close to you. You still got to get close to God on your own. In Joel's context, it was a swarm of locusts. And might I suggest in our context, it is a swarm of unseen emotional locusts that will devour your inner life. Uh, brothers and sisters, we've got to get close to God, but Joel echoes the voice of God, and what Joel says, even now, you can still return. The word return here means a total reorientation of life back to God. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we've got to get to the place and the point in our Christian maturity where we can reset and reorient our lives back to God. Sometimes, oh, what I've understood is, thank you, Judy, for that good read. Sometimes with mechanical devices, we've got to turn them off so that God can turn us on. What I'm saying is that, brothers and sisters, sometimes when we have a mechanical failing with our laptops, sometimes with our phones, we've got to turn them off so that we can reset. Do I have any witnesses today? What I'm saying is that, brothers and sisters, every now and then, we've got to reset and reorient ourselves in the way and in the will of God. I'm, I'm tickled because I often hear people that say uh, they, they, they got to get back to God and many times they say uh, when I got to get back to God I'm going to make a 360 degree turnaround. <laughs> that tickles me because brothers and sisters what that means is that you do this. <laughs> What I'm saying is, you're turning right back to the same point. What I'm trying to tell you is that we've got to make a 180 degree turn. In other words, you've got to turn all the way around and recalibrate yourself and follow the will and the way of God. I'm, I'm, I'm moving to my clothes. But if y'all just hear me, there are a few things in the text that the text attempts to teach us. Uh, one of the things that the text attempts to teach us is that we've got to have an inward intensity and not an outward array. We've got to have an inward intensity and not just an outward all right, I want to say that one more time for those of y'all who perhaps didn't hear me. You've got to have an inward intensity, not just an outward array. The text shares with us in verse 13, it says, Rend your hearts and not your garments. In other words, uh, brothers and sisters, it's saying, Tear open your heart and not to close. I want to give y'all a biblical context in the biblical world to tear a garment was the ultimate and outward expression of returning to God. It expressed intense emotion because of an egregious misfortune. In the ancient times, you knew somebody was in the process of penance and repentance because they had on what we call a sackcloth. A sackcloth was a big, itchy, scratchy, coarsely woven garment that would be put on uh, when it was time for folks to lament. And I mean, when you put this garment on, it was clear to all of the community that a person, that the person in question had sinned and now was in the process of lamenting and wanting to return back to God. 
I'm reminded of when I was in high school, I read a novel uh, in Miss Woods' class, Miss Woods' English class, I'll never forget it, uh, that Miss Woods' class, uh, she had us to read the Scarlet Letter. And in the Scarlet Letter, brothers and sisters, what I discovered is that there was a woman who committed adultery, but they only tagged the woman. Now, let me preach this thing. They only tagged the woman, and she had to walk around with a scarlet A on her chest. She had to walk around with a red A on her chest that said that she had committed adultery. Uh, what, what, what I'm saying, somebody is trying to say, well, Reverend Lecher, what in the world this old novel is telling you? Well, what this is saying to me, brothers and sisters, is that folks get hung up on outward expressions. Right. That it is too many of us in this world today get hung up on symbols and don't worry about living in a level of sanctity. Brothers and sisters, there are too many of us as believers, we get hung up on the outward symbols of things and never have an inward intensity to change. As a matter of fact, many of us, we confuse symbols with sanctity. We believe that those symbols give us amnesty or absolution from sin. That's why you have folks that get baptized and still rude and hostile to others. That's why you have folks that want to take the Lord's Supper and they're still backbiters. You have folks that do all of these things. You sing in the choir and they still gossip. Brothers and sisters, we've got to get to the place where we have an inward change and not just an outward expression. Let's understand that returning to God requires an inward reality and not just an outward ceremony. Do I have any witnesses, uh, brothers and sisters? Uh, because the outward ceremony was saying to folks that you were delivered, but not necessarily reflecting a behavior that a Christian ought to have. Brothers and sisters, we've got to get to the place that we let go of symbols and walk in the place of sanctity. I'm preaching. I don't say nothing else. I'm preaching. Brothers and sisters, uh, sometimes uh, we get to the place and point uh, because we trust so much in symbols, our mouths write checks that something can't come out. <laughs> our mouths write checks that something can't catch. I think Jesus uh, or, or the Lord said it best in Isaiah 29 and 13. He says, people draw near with to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. I'm, I'm, I'm about done, y'all. An outward array calls for you to talk the talk. An outward array calls for us to have a whole lot of lip service. An outward array, brothers and sisters, again, talks, uh, calls for us to talk the talk, but an inward intensity calls for us to walk the walk. An outward array allows for us to say black lives matter, but an inward intensity calls for us to give Colin Kaepernick a job. We love the outward array. But many times we fail to commit with inward intensities because the inward intensity calls us or challenges us uh, or, or challenges the depth of our Christian faith. The inward intensity calls uh, for us uh, it challenges the earnestness of our walk with God, the truth of our belief, 
the authenticity of our conviction because if we fail to match our outward array with our inward intensity, we don't really love God. In other words, brothers and sisters, if we do all that talking and we don't do the walking, we don't really love God. And I'm glad the Apostle Paul told us like this. He's agreeing with me. The Apostle Paul is agreeing with me. He says, you can do all this stuff. You can speak uh, with uh, tongues as angels. You can have all of these gifts. You can do all of this stuff. But if you don't move in the place of love, if you don't act in love, you just making a whole lot of noise. It is my desire that no pleasant parishioner in their lives just make a whole lot of noise. Making a whole lot of noise means that you're sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Don't, don't, don't just make a whole lot of noise, y'all. Don't make a whole lot of noise. Uh, there's one thing I share with you, brothers and sisters, that you've got to have inward intensity and not just an outward array. And then I also want to tell you, uh, y'all, you've got to be emotionally invested. You've got to be emo that, That's what the text says. It's not Pastor Letcher. I'm not just blowing smoke. But what I'm sharing with you is what the text says. This is what the text gave me. You've got to be emotionally invested. It says, come to me with weeping, with fasting, and mourning. You've got to be emotionally invested. When you've been far away from God, I, I ain't challenging you about why you were away from God. Some folks say because the church been closed. Some folks say there are a whole lot of excuses. But we all know excuses are tools of the incumbent bill, used to build monuments of nothingness, and those who use them seldom amount to anything more. But I don't know what your excuse is. But brothers and sisters, Whatever it is, God calls us to be emotional. When you have been away from God and you truly desire to return to God, what the text says, rend your heart. Open your heart. In other words, break it open. Smash it in such a way that you are vulnerable enough to display your feelings before God. In other words, you can cry before God, you can shout before God, you can holler before God, because God has done something for you that you couldn't do for yourself. Brothers and sisters, we've got to be believers. And the only way that we can be true believers is that we not only have right thinking intellectually, but we've got to be deep fillers emotionally. I think that goes hand in hand. We've got to think, and I am, I'm not trying to disconnect the black church from thinking, but brothers and sisters, don't ever leave behind the feeling. Because, brothers and sisters, there was a time where folks used to say, well, there ain't nothing in a feeling. Uh, I think that came across during the time where Tina Turner was saying, what's love got to do, got to do with it? I know there's theology in songs. Y'all, I keep using songs, but I think it blesses us with what the Lord is trying to tell us. That we're trying to tell us that there is nothing in a feeling. But I would push back to say it ain't nothing wrong, uh, brothers and sisters, with uh, it's nothing bad about feeling good. Reverend Dr. Joel Gregory once said that our emotions are the handles by which our faith grips us. I, I want to say that again. Our emotions are the handles by which faith grips us. There are some things, as old songwriter says, there are some things 
that I may not know. There are some places that I may not go. But I am sure of this one thing, that God is real. Then the songwriter goes on to say, for I can feel it. And I saw, there, there's some things that you got to feel. There's some things you got to feel because there's some things that you can think but you can't feel. You got to feel gratitude. You, you've got to feel reverence. You've got to feel love. You've got to feel joy. There's some things that you've got to feel. I'm done, y'all. Thank you, Lord. Joel suggesting that it is possible for us to make a comeback and to regain relationship with God, tighten up the grip and soar in the jet stream of the Holy Spirit. The last piece, after we've got to be emotionally invested, brothers and sisters, we've got to trade uh, calamity for compassion. We've got to trade calamity for compassion. Somebody's saying we're well, running out. I, I, I don't see that in the text. I'm glad you said something so I can usher you back to the text. We see verse 13 uh, in the New International uh, Version. It says, For his gracious is compassionate, slow to anger, bounding in love, and he relents from sending. Calamity. In other words, brothers and sisters, we've got to get to a place where we want to exchange calamity for compassion. We've got to exchange calamity for compassion. It's interesting that to me, many times that, uh, you know, we, we don't know how good we have it until the good that we have is gone. I'm reminded of an episode of Family Matters. I, as a youngster, I used to love Family Matters. I used to love Family Matters. I, I used to love Family Matters, and one of the main characters of Family Matters was Mr. Steve Urkel. And I just discovered that Mr. Steve Urkel wasn't even supposed to be a main character. He was supposed to be a one hit quitter. But he gained the love and the compassion of the people so much so that he not only became a constant character, but he became the main character. But what I discovered about uh, uh, old uh, Steve Urkel, that he had uh, an apple of his eye. Her name was Laura Winslow. <laughs> but Laura Winslow, she didn't like Steve like he liked her. <coughs> Laura was in love with Stefan Urkel, <laughs> which was Steve's alter ego. And brothers and sisters, if you look at that particular show, you will see that although Stefan Urkel was uh, alluring to Laura's eyes, Steve knew her heart. And what I'm trying to share with you today, brothers and sisters, that's how it is when we get afar and adrift from God. We see things in the world that are attractive to the eyes. But God knows. Uh -huh. Can I say one other thing? And I'm done. I'm reminded of God's compassion for us. I'm thinking about God's compassion and I think about a couple. They were fussing and fighting, kind of like me and my wife do sometimes. We can edit that out, can we? <laughs> but what I'm sharing with you is that a husband and a wife were fighting, brothers and sisters, uh, what the wife suggested was is that uh, why don't we write down on this paper 
uh, some things that we don't like about each other in an effort to get over this fight. So brothers and sisters, they both grabbed a sheet of paper and a pen and they went to write. And they started looking at each other. And the husband looked at the wife. <laughs> I know Katrina, you watching. <laughs> started looking uh, at each other. And they looked at each other real mean. And then started writing what they don't like about each other. The husband started writing stuff that he didn't like about her. And then she looked at him and she started writing stuff that she didn't like about him. They did it back and forth. She started writing stuff about him. He started writing stuff about her. Brothers and sisters, they did that back and forth. She started writing stuff about him. He started writing stuff about her. But brothers and sisters, she got tired of it and she put a pen down after she wrote a whole lot of stuff. But the husband kept looking at her. <laughs> Every time he looked at her, he wrote something on the paper. Every time he looked at her, he wrote something on the paper. Every time he looked at her, he wrote something on the paper. And the wife got a little bit upset and she started to cry because she had wrote one thing on one side of the paper, but it looked like the husband had two or three sheets and he kept on writing on the paper. Brothers and sisters, and then at one point he got up and he looked at her again and he still started writing because he got upset a little bit more. He was looking at her and he wrote some more stuff on the paper. But oh, brothers and sisters, it got to the point where they had to trade their papers. Wife looked at the paper and immediately she became ashamed because when she looked at the paper, brothers and sisters, she wanted to take the paper back because when she looked at the paper, every time he wrote something about her, he said, I love her. And, uh, brothers and sisters, he said, even though you've been mean, I love her. Y'all not helping me today. He said, even though I don't want to be here, I still love you. Even though you have been unfaithful, I still love you. Even though you have been mean, I still love you. And all down his paper, he wrote, I love you. When she turned it over, it said, I love you. And when, what I'm sharing with you today, that even though, oh,
book. I know y'all can't hear the acoustics. I know it sounds terrible, but brothers and sisters, we having a good time in the Lord in here. Let's give God the praise. Let's give God the praise. Savvy, you can give on our website 
at www.pgmbcstl.org. Again, that is www.pgmbcstl.org. Again, we're thankful for your faithfulness. Also, brothers and sisters, we just uh, we want you to understand how you can join the church. If you want to join the church, there are a few ways that you can join the church. You can join the church by reaching out to us as a parishioner, or you can join the church uh, through calling in to the church office. Uh, that is 314-535-7548. Uh, and you can leave a message, or you can leave uh, you can email us at ghpruitt at gmail.com and you can leave a messenger, message saying that you want to be uh, a part of the body of Christ uh, through the ministry of Pleasant Dream. And we will return your message within 48 hours. Brothers and sisters, we have had a great time. Amen. 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 Exceedingly joy yes. to the yes. only wise God, our Savior, be glorified.